personally, I have to say, I work just as hard, maybe harder, over the course of these days off, uh, praying, uh, catching up on some books that had stacked up, and yeah, and trying to stay up with all that's going on in our country and the news, and asking the Lord, what might be your word for us in 2023? And I think everyone knows we are in a battle for the soul of America. There is spiritual wickedness in high places. The Antichrist agenda to reconstruct our country and strip us of our freedom is evident everywhere. And yet millions of our fellow Americans, including many professing Christians, seem blissfully unaware of what's going on and remain complacent even to the point of voting for those who seek to further enslave them. And to be very personal, I was wrestling like never before with hearing, trying to hear from God about how we could apply the biblical worldview to the warfare waged against us. And as I uh, read these books and caught up on all the reading and watched the news, and I have to tell you, I, uh, my mind began to get so crammed, I thought it was going to explode. And I realized that at, 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 I was laying in bed at night and, and saying, Lord, you know, I, I, I really need, we need to hear from you. We really, really need to hear from you. You know, when you've been doing this as long as I have, I, you could give me any topic and I could teach on it. But how many of you know there are times when you really have to hear a specific uh, word and I was at a place where I wasn't frantic I was just just antsy and laying in bed and laying in bed and then I heard or seemed to hear Psalm 46 uh, verse 10 that says be still and know that I am God I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And that word was so real. And, and you know, if you know me, most of you have known us a long time. I'm very careful when I say the Lord spoke to me. I am not into this modern jargon where God talks to some of these people like he's a magpie you know and God told me this God told me that the saith the Lord the saith the Lord the saith the Lord the saith the Lord and you can hear 45 minutes of never-ending words from the Lord it was like if you'll be still I'll speak and peace came and so I went to that particular night I, I really slept well and woke up in the morning and my mind somehow had cleared and I uh, I was reminded of the prophet Elijah in first Kings chapter 8 19 I won't read it all but he was he was seeking the Lord and the Lord passed by and there was a wind and there was a, a fire and there was earthquake but then in verses 11 and 12 it says, But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire a still, small voice. And I just want to encourage you, maybe your mind these days is racing and overloaded with information and I do believe we're supposed to stay up on what's going on I do believe we should be reading good books and reading our Bibles and being aware of what's happening in our country but it can come to the place where your mind can get so full 
that you can't hear from the Lord. You're hearing from Fox News and the book of Isaiah and Facebook. But anyway, long story short, I heard this. And I will say I believe it was the Lord. And it was four words, two commands. Obey God. Defy tyrants. Obey God. Defy tyrants. And the interesting thing about it was I had 15 or 20 different thoughts in my folder of teachings that I was thinking about doing. And those four words covered in a large sense. In other words, everything I was thinking about doing and swirling around can be fitted under those words. So, in the coming weeks, uh, I'll be doing some sermons in the series that I think are critically important. Uh, One is on dominion or domination. Dominion is godly. Domination is ungodly. And we're going to show you how, where all this tyranny comes from. And it's not new. It, it's as old as the early chapters of Genesis. God gave man dominion over the earth. But when sin entered, that dominion was perverted. And instead of man taking dominion over the earth, men sought to take dominion over other men. And we'll talk about that. I want to teach on the tactics of tyrants, which have not changed since the beginning of history. And when you know the tactics of tyrants, you've got half the battle won. I want to do at least one message, maybe more, on the power of language Whoever controls the language controls the culture. There is a satanic purpose behind this woke culture and how terms are being redefined. Even now as as far as to redefine men and women and marriage and gender. And, and that's not by accident. That is all part of the tyrannical spirit that is seeking to take away our freedoms. I have a message on angels of light. You know, the tyrants of old ruled with an iron fist. They were very overt, very obvious. But modern tyrants subdue the citizens under their control by deceiving them into thinking they're doing it for their own good. I have a message on educated idiots. My friend Gary DeMar said, whoever controls the schools rules the world. And this is why tyrants always take over public education school systems and seek the control of our children and they must be defied. What I'm really looking forward to is 1984 is now. Uh, George Orwell's dystopian description of the world under the control of Big Brother government was eerily prophetic. And I've, I've really Uh, You know, how many of you know God can inspire people, whether they're his people or not? Orwell wrote the book in 1947, envisioning something 37 years in the future. The truth is, this vision that he had of a tyrannical system is really just now coming into place. The book, had the greatest, one of the great opening lines of all literature is 19, in 1984. It says, it was a cold, clear day in April, and all the clocks were striking 13. 
And when we get into what that means, how many of you feel like the world is completely out of kilter? That nothing is as it should be. That reality itself is being bended. Well, there is a reason. Christianity a la carte. And I think I've mentioned this, but the average Christian today has not got a biblical worldview. And when Barna Research did the research of what Christians, what the worldview is, they found it was syncretistic, which just means it's a mixture. That the modern American church, by and large, the vast majority, do not have a biblical worldview. They have some biblical worldview but then they reach into new age they reach into wokeism they reach into the culture and they take bits and pieces of other belief systems and mix it all together and the end result is what we've got now and i'm just going to give you one more i mean this is i may not i'm this is not in order i may and i'll be adding others but uh I want to do one on what is the mark of the beast. I am really looking forward to this one because, frankly, I'm a little sick of hearing the bizarre things that are being taught about the mark of the beast. One tactic of tyrants is controlling people through fear. And one fear for many Christians is the dreaded mark of the beast. And I'm going to look to the Word of God and show you why it ain't going to happen. Well, that's a preview. So I'll see you all next week. (laughs) The theme is our obedience to God will always require the defiance of tyrants. The nature of tyranny itself will force the issue. We will either obey God and defy tyrants, or we will obey tyrants and defy God. The tyrannical totalitarian state is always on a collision course with Christianity and the kingdom of God over the issue of obedience. So tonight, we want to take the cork out of the jug and look up, dive a little deeper into that thought. What does it mean to obey God? I truly believe the pathetic current condition of American culture can be traced to the pathetic condition of the modern American church when it comes to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Our pews are filled with counterfeit Christians who claim Jesus as Savior but do not obey Him as Lord. The great A.W. Tozer said many years ago, Jesus Christ today has almost no authority at all among the groups that call themselves by his name. I dare say some sitting here even tonight see the gospel as more of an invitation than as a command. But the Apostle Paul spoke of the gospel as a command sinners must obey. In 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 and 8, he says, When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance upon those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who said, Repent and believe the gospel. And yet, the end of most sermons that are evangelistic end with an invitation. And we've missed the, the fact that Jesus is Lord. He is the King. And I understand it could be taken as an invitation, but I like to think of it as a command that you either obey or you don't. Peter said the same thing or something similar in 1 Peter 4, 17. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? 
The old Puritan said the gospel is a statute, a law to be obeyed. It comes with the highest authority. Unless it's translated into our lives and embodied in our actions, it is a curse. It is not enough to go and hear the gospel, to speak about it or approve it, unless we obey it. The Lord Jesus himself asked this question of those who were calling themselves his disciples in Luke 6, 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? And not do the things I say. He gave the same thought in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7 verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who obeys, he who does the will of my Father in heaven. The Apostle John cited obedience Uh, And commandment keeping is the only sure sign that we have of truly knowing the Lord. He said in 1 John 2, 3, and 4, now by this we know that we know him. By this we know that we know him. Are you hearing that? This is your assurance. By this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. I'm very grieved at the lifestyle of many church-going people in America today. They go to church on Sunday and live like the world the rest of the week. And things that are going on in the church that are just overlooked or ignored... And God forbid that we would preach a sermon on sin that makes anybody feel bad. Now notice he does not say keeping the commandments will save us. That's important. He says that keeping the commandments is the sign we are saved. Don't get that confused. The modern American church has become so focused on grace at the expense of obedience that many who go to church on Sunday are no different than their neighbor next door who may be a Hindu. Nothing against Hindus, but (laughs) the late Zig Ziglar once said, if God had wanted us to live in a permissive society, he would have given us 10 suggestions, not 10 commandments. When God's people refuse to obey God's law, he turns them over to tyrants. When Christian, so-called Christian nations, whether it's Israel or America, refuse to obey God's law, he turns them over to tyrants. In 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 and 4, it says, Now it came to pass when Rehoboam, one of the kings of Israel, had established the kingdom and strengthened himself, that he forsook the law of the Lord. And all Israel along with him. And in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shishak, the king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem because they had transgressed against the Lord. They weren't keeping his commandments. The king and all the people. And this is God's country. This is Israel. So what happened? The tyrants came. This time one from Egypt. And in verse 5 it says, And then the prophet came to Rehoboam and the leaders of Judah and said, Thus says the Lord, You have forsaken me, and therefore I have left you in the hands of Shishak. And the people began to suffer under this Egyptian. And there was a partial repentance in verse 6. People humble themselves and said, the Lord is right. So in verse 7, now when the Lord saw they humbled themselves, the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah the prophet saying, they have humbled themselves. Therefore, I will not destroy them. I will not destroy them. I don't believe God's going to destroy. He didn't destroy Israel. They forsook the law. They didn't obey God. 
He sent a tyrant, but he said, I'm not going to destroy them. I'll grant them some deliverance. My wrath shall not be poured out on Jerusalem by his hand. But, verse 8, and this is the one I was after. And this is where we are today. In my humble, prophetic opinion. Nevertheless, God says, they will, through the prophet, they will be his servants. That they may distinguish my service from the service of the kingdom of the nations. Another translation says, however, they will become his servants so they can recognize the difference between serving me and serving the kingdoms of the land. Another version says, so that they may see how different my yoke is from the yoke of the kingdoms. And I believe this is where we are today. I believe God is not going to destroy America, but he's going to let us experience a season of tyranny until we wake up to see the difference between life under God and life under tyrants. I do believe eventually, I know, an awakening will happen. Even the dullest dullard will be awakened as this continues. What's going on now? And it's gotten worse. And it will be a season where it may get even worse. But God is behind all of it, beloved. God will not for tyrants force you. Tyrants break your will. God makes you willing. The lesson can't be clearer. The time has come to repent and obey God. And when we do that, it puts us into a position to defy tyrants. Now, what's a tyrant? A cruel and oppressive ruler who governs without restriction. Now, once again... Tyranny has evolved somewhat. In ancient times, a tyrant was a ruler who seized power without legal right. In modern times, it can refer to any governing authority that exercises the illegitimate use of power to control others. Remember this, with tyrants, it's all about power and control. What's going on up there in Washington and some of our state houses? It's not about Republicans, Democrats, issues, legislate. It's about power and control. Yes. The definition of tyrannical government is political authority that exerts harsh, cruel, or unjust control over the people. The Bible teaches us that the farther a nation moves away from God, the closer it moves toward totalitarianism, which is a system of government that is centralized and dictatorial and requires complete subservience to the state. In other words, and I'll quote the brilliant English author George Orwell, he said that means that the state essentially takes the place of God. He said a totalitarian state is in effect a theocracy, which means a God-ruled people. And its ruling class, in order to keep its position, has to be thought of as infallible. Oh, I'm so tempted to uh, get off track. But today... They're basically telling us, don't believe your own eyes. I mean, the re reality is being bent. The truth is being corrupted to the point where you can see hundreds of thousands of people streaming in across our southern border and yet you have the Vice President of the United States and the Secretary of Homeland Security saying right into the camera to the American people, the border's secure. 
Don't believe your lying eyes. This is the mark of tyranny. Friends, this is what tyrants do. They hold themselves as infallible, as gods who can define reality. Like the blasphemous so-called Respect for Marriage Act, where a, a, a president of the United States who professes to be a Christian blasphemes the Word of God by thinking he has the power to redefine marriage. And you know, the American people, well, you know, what? Is that what he did? Orwell said, the totalitarian state will set up unquestionable dogmas and it alters them from day to day. It needs dogmas because it needs absolute obedience from its subjects as dictated by the needs of power politics. Now, this is why Christians committed to obeying God will always come into conflict with the tyrannical state. We see it in Acts chapter 4 and 5, the Jewish council, which was the political power of the day, arrested the disciples and forbade them to teach in the name of Jesus. And here they are in court. Acts 5, 27, 28. They brought them and set them before the council and the high priest said, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in that name? And look, you filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. And verse 29 is my base text for the whole sermon series because it's, it's all right here. He, and Peter said, We ought to obey God rather than men. We ought to obey God rather than men. Now, here, here's the point. I don't want you to miss this. That has always been the case. That was true in America's best years. That was true under the Reagan administration, the Trump administration, when the country was ripping and roaring and everything was good and people were prospering. The borders were secure. There was plenty of oil and gas and it was just as true then we ought to obey God rather than men but what has happened is we've come to the place where all that's changed and we're going to be forced to obey God or men you'll not be able to stay on the sidelines and I know you understand that but many don't and I believe that verse sums up the whole sermon series see the same thing in Acts 4 they verses 18 to 20 and they call them and commanded them not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus but Peter and John answered and said whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God you judge for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard Today, this is what's happening in America. There's an open assault on Christians and on the church and on the Bible. Pastors who speak the truth are threatened with loss of their tax exemption status. Conservatives are canceled or shut down on social media. And as I said, the president and Congress set themselves above God in the redefinition of marriage. Meanwhile, surveys say that only one out of every 10 Christian American pastors will preach about cultural issues of the day. Many will cite Romans 13. Well, the Bible says we, we must obey authority. And all authority is from God. So if we resist authority, we're resisting God himself. 
You know, the truth is, Romans 13 does say that. But there's a presupposition to the whole passage. And that is that it is not ungodly authority that to obey and submit to would require you to disobey God. See, you can't take one passage of Scripture and ignore what else the Bible has to say about any particular subject. We are commanded to obey the law, but not when obeying man's law means breaking God's law. The great Scottish reformer John Knox said, True it is that God has commanded kings to be obeyed. But likewise true it is that in things kings commit against his glory, God has commanded no obedience. Knox ran the risk in his day of being tried for treason, standing against the unjust laws of his day. He said, let it be noted that the prophet of God sometimes may teach treason against kings. And yet neither he nor such as obey the word spoken in the Lord's name by him offend God. There is a kind of disobedience to the civil authorities that does not offend God. As a matter of fact, it honors God. America's founding fathers were accused of unchristian behavior. They were accused of uh, tyranny and rebellion against King George of England. I mean, hey, we wouldn't even be here tonight if they had not defied tyrants. You understand that? I mean, the whole reason we're Americans, that we're not all speaking English, is that, well, we do speak English, but it's a different kind of English. But we're, 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 we're here. We're a nation. Because our founding fathers defied tyrants in order to obey God. Benjamin Franklin said, famously, rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. By the way, that motto, that's the state motto of the state of Virginia to this day. So, let me land the plane for tonight. What have we said? I don't know. (laughs) Your takeaway is and as your pastor, and I submit this to you, I'm not one that requires you to accept what I say the word of the Lord is for us. But I don't say it lightly when I say I do believe God told me, obey God, defy tyrants. This is the task for Ray, for Elizabeth, for the people of God, for American Christianity, After all, the other side of the coin is if we disobey God, we will end up obeying tyrants. I don't think it's really going to be that big of a... The choice won't be unclear. We are being pushed into a place where neutrality will be impossible. The modern American tyrants must attack the church because their socialistic system cannot tolerate God. When will we realize there is a spirit at work? It's an antichrist spirit. It's these are those Democrats and these goofballs are in that our enemy is not flesh and blood. Our enemy is spiritual. And those spirits are working through individuals. It's true. But we need to understand this is spiritual warfare. And the socialistic spirit, the spirit of socialism, communism, whatever you want to call it, is here. 
In the coming weeks, you're going to be shocked to see how far it's gone. But this, it, they cannot tolerate us. And, and unlike us, we, you know, we, we, we live and let live, but no. They are not wired that way. Martin Bormann, one of Hitler's henchmen, said, National Socialism and Christianity are irreconcilable. We are not going to be able to live together. I tell you that. The day will come. We will not be able to coexist with this spirit. That's why I say we're being pushed into a place that's going to call for courage. Tyrants always rule the world through the infection of fear. And we're going, again, we're going to be showing you how some of those tactics work. You, you are well aware of some of them, but they must be defied. The world is waiting for the church to rise. I'll finish with A.W. Tozer. A frightened world needs a fearless church. Father, I pray that in this hour of fear, fear of inflation, fear of COVID, fear of global warming, fear of the mark of the beast, fear of one world government, in a world full of fear, that you would raise up a fearless church, a church that is committed to obey you as Lord in all things, to apply the Word of God to every issue, to submit ourselves to your Lordship, to what you have to say on every subject. And that in doing so, our light comes out from under the basket. And we can be that light to the world. We can be that salt in the earth that preserves the earth and that saves the country for your name and your glory. Amen. Amen. That's all I got. Hallelujah. Why don't you stand to your feet? There's much you can do, every one of you. Every one of you. There's much you can do.